not many people know that talking about vanilla for me is a challenge. I embraced it though, and I got you a rather, in my view, unusual top kind of vanilla options that are vanilla, but not vanilla, but really, really rich, dark, smoky vanilla. And I want to start with something that reignited my interest in dark, kind of smoky, vanilla noir type of fragrances. And this is the brand that I'm not very familiar with. Yet, <laughs> when I looked at the price, I was like, huh, should I get familiar with it? Or maybe not. It's Kaylee. Kylie? Or Kaylee? Uh, I think it's, for some reason, I want to say it's one of the uh, niche slash celebrity lines, but I mean, don't quote me on that. It's probably worth Googling that. They have a line of fragrances. I kind of like their packaging, but I don't have enough of a impression about their aesthetic in terms of olfactory design to really invest into buying something. However, thanks to my subscribers, I got a few samples just to try. And the one that I am holding here is called Vanilla 28. I already have it sprayed here. Let's just kind of refresh. So what it really reignited my interest in finding kind of a vanilla noir worthy fragrance that I would actually purchase in full bottle is this particular sample. I picked it up randomly, started wearing, and then I couldn't stop wearing it. The cool thing about that is that Vanilla 28 is, creates a very warm, to me, somewhat amber, oh, I don't want to say smoky because I don't detect any smoke, but you know, like one of those slightly burnt, burnt vanilla milk biscuits, <laughs> something like that. Just ever so slightly, like if you take a dessert and you just leave it in the oven for a bit too long, this is what it, like the vibes that it gives me. I indulge in it. It's. It's, it's exactly what I was looking for when I was trying to describe the effect of vanilla noir, like a black vanilla fragrance, if such a thing exists. Probably not. Keeping that in mind, a few other options that in my mind are just as good, if not better. And this, let's talk about things that I probably will never buy full size, but I really appreciate the craft. So the first one is going to be something that I have, thanks to my subscriber, Bulgari Rubinia. So Bulgari Rubinia, it's, it belongs to their top-of-the-shelf boutique line. I love how the, um, the bottles look. Don't love the price. This. And also, this is one of those boutique lines that doesn't get nearly as much attention, let's say, as boutique line by Lancome. Guerlain or Chanel or any others. However, I think it really deserves some attention. So what we have here is again kind of this like balsamic woody, it's not woody, it's kind of like there somewhere behind. I would say balsamic somewhat toasted vanilla. This is the word I was looking for. It's so comfortable. It's a little it's a, this is a little bit more sugary, like sugar powdery. Again, in comparison, I, like I have about a dozen of like sweet vanilla milk, milky kind of perfumes that we can talk about in some other video. This is gonna be all much darker, richer, heavier scents. Heavier, not in the sense that they're gonna smother you, but in a way that they lay in lower frequencies, frequencies of olfactory design. So Rubinia, I am like, Look, look up the bottle if like if I have time I'll put it somewhere it's just mmm to have that on my shelf that would be awesome and yet I'm in love with how comfortable and dark this vanilla is I like it a little bit more for its depth than Kayali vanilla 28 but I'm just being honest unless I get a lavish gift from Bulgari <laughs> I don't think it will ever happen that I will have one of those bottles, but I find them to be drop-dead gorgeous in terms of the bottle design. I mean, and no surprise, Bulgari is a fine jewelry designer from Italy. 
Okay, yet one more from the same maker. Bulgari Erea, Erea. Ooh, now we are going to a much darker depths. We are going like beneath the surface, not because it's mossy or earthy on any way. It's just Bulgari Erethia also comes from the boutique line, prohibitively expensive. But man, here we're going towards something toasted, so toasted and so almost with some kind of dense plummy jam. Oh, extraordinary. Probably this is way more balsamic, but in this, like to me, again, it's a very plummy, who knows what kind of multi fruit, multi berry jam is here. It just gets very toasty to me. This is something that I thought, I actually got it in the, is it right? oops, I I think I got it in the swap, I'm not sure. This is something that reminds me of what I would expect. Elisab, they have something royal. So some of their like uh, luxury scents that are very rich and sweet and gourmandy, but like I think royal is the one that's a little bit more toasted, a little bit more plummy almost. So this, I imagine would be very friendly to toward some of those Arabian creations, you know, like Arabic style of blending, because this is a powerhouse. It's not screaming, but it's just, it, you keep sinking and sinking and sinking. So, when we talk about the, the vanilla noir, like these rich, dark, toasted vanilla scents, as I told you, vanillin and vanilla itself there is an important heart note but it's not necessarily the leading note. It really needs a lot of strong support. One really great example that is rather kind of affordable depending where you look at it, look for it, is uh, Saint Pont Vanilla Leather. They have their kind of golden bottles boutique line, but like the last time I looked, it was actually fairly affordable. And thanks to, to a friend of mine, I got a decant. So here, Supposedly we get a le leather accent that kind of frames vanilla, but to me it only gives it a little bit more of a confident sturdy base. So this vanilla doesn't become so sweet that it is, what would I like, just pull out of the, out of the air for just the run of the mill sweet vanilla. Well, you know, vanillas that come with, comes to our South Pacific. Um, certain mental vanillas or even, you know, uh, La Parfum La Lique. Vanillas of this kind are very edible, very vanillin, like almost edible gourmands. That's a different category we can talk about some other time. So vanilla leather, I like it because this, the, the leathery, almost I would say kind of tobacco-y framing here, really keeps it away from becoming an edible, like uh, this like Barbie like vanilla. This one is right there on the border. It's so user-friendly that I, it almost crosses that border toward a vanilla fragrance that is like, mm, okay. And yet, it has just enough of an interest that I wanna wear this completely down and see if I'm ready for the full-size bottle. So yeah, Vanilla Leather by Saint Dupont. Again, a very confident and very good example. I would put them kind of on par with Kayali Vanilla 28. They're different enough, but they're both, you know, like they had just the right density. They're not too dark, not too dense, like Bulgari Area and some other ones that I'm gonna show you. They're just right, just right, which makes them like all the way day through, unisex, comfortable, not overpowering, but like Vanilla Noir type of scents. Now, a very popular take on Vanilla Noir, how to darken it, deepen it, is to add myrrh. Or myrrh? Myrrh? I'm gonna show you three options that I'm kind of trying to pair up myself. So one is gonna be rather famous, and especially after it was discontinued, which is 
oddly commonly uh, very commonly happens with designer perfumes they become historic after they're gone actually I have it somewhere here do I no I don't okay uh, this is Valentino mirror absolute well rather interesting looking bottle it's like plain but posh gray and again here this is the kind of vanilla that gets a little bit more dense it lays lower because of a somewhat many you know like many many candles burning type of effect like I don't know if you've ever been to into um, Orthodox Christian Church the tradition there is to burn a, like many many candles and they're really small it's actually similar to a lot of temples but Orthodox churches tend to be a little bit smaller so the the condensed smell of the burning wax is, is usually something that you can't forget once you experienced it so this is what myrrh usually smells to me it's the smell of, of the church it's smell of the art specifically Orthodox the Christian Church I find that Catholic churches have quite a different aroma at least to, to my nose so it's a lot of this kind of like burned warm wax with the vanilla a very different take almost turning it toward a little bit more honey like type of fragrance without any explicit reference to honey and probably well let's talk about two other options and we'll try to pick the one that I might love the most another option comes from rather <laughs> I would call it a somewhat controversial launch Christian Louboutin launched uh, their own line of perfumes and the one that I got from my subscriber to to talk about and test thank you very much is Luby Croc Luby Croc I already have it here I'm gonna refresh it because <clears throat> I swear to God it needs a lot of refreshment I have never seen so much ado about nothing the bottles look interesting enough I'll give them that if you like that kind of aesthetic but the prices and especially what's in the bottles given the prices uh, leaves you in this polite disbelief essentially a very watered-down version of vanilla plus myrrh very hard to pinpoint what else is there I would even take it toward those vanilla milky lactonic fragrances the one that comes to mind would be maybe not the best example but like vanilla milk at the base of Killian adults this is probably even no it's not even it's way more diluted way more diluted I'm struggling maybe maybe Zadig and Voltaire for her which is pretty much just sweet whipped cream something of that nature but now imagine this super diluted kind of lactonic sweet vanilla milk type of fragrance with a little bit of a myrrh but it's so elusive that I just sure yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's like along the same lines like if we had to compare like come on there's no comparison when I see why when uh, Valentino mirror a salute right right us became such a hit because for a designer perfume that at some point was widely available let's say 50 mil for 50 60 dollars on if you buy it online that's really good and this is a very unusual take on comfortable but vanilla centric not too edible not too complex not too heavy not too girly perfume so far luby croc is I'm just what was that and another ver another option 
that's mm, so good. Um, that in my view probably gonna be way way more niche. This is Bengali Rouge by Papillon. Papillon perfumery is something that I don't have much of a familiarity with. But those things, like a few appearances that it made on other challenge, uh, channels, I, I heard good things. Like, this is the kind of niche that, you know, they know what they're doing, allegedly. What can I say? Deeper. Brighter at the same time. It's just much, much louder. And I say there are a lot of hot kitchen spices here. Think cardamom, cinnamon, maybe even pepper that take it the effect of myrrh a little bit away and bring it closer to fragrances like Bahim by K. Commissary or even uh, Serge Luton's Shergi. Let's double check my impressions. What do we see here? This is myrrh, honey, tonka beans, vanilla, santal, santal and uh, Turkish rose. There is a bit of a essential oils effect to my nose. It's a little unrefined. It's either, it kind of depends, if you like this kind of essential oil effect when things smell like essential oils when you buy them and mix them. A lot of people absolutely adore that aesthetic and a lot of indie brands support that aesthetic and you get that kind of profiling. I feel that um, Bengali Rouge by Papillon definitely has this kind of like, I mixed essential oils together and saw what, what happened. Yet the depth and brightness, simultaneous depth and brightness of these kind of super honey, tonka bean and myrrh driven vanilla scent is quite impressive. I'm almost like, unfortunately my sample evaporated. That's the tragedy of buying a lot of decants. Don't be like me. Only buy stuff that you're gonna use. So I'm gonna give it a go and see if I warm up to it. A vanilla fragrance that I could not find any comparisons for. I searched high and low, I couldn't. This is a very unique, sweet, honey-like, and yet there's something else there, vanilla scent. I just, I'm craving a full-size bottle, but this is a European release that are not, not as easy to find in the United States. And this is Sylvain de la Courte Valkyrie. So Sylvain de la Courte, she has uh, a history, if I'm not mistaken, she was leading sort of the product creation of perfumes for Guerlain. I hope I'm not wrong there. Um, and eventually she ventured out on her own and created a musk collection and vanilla collection. So she has a whole vanilla collection when they're very different vanillas. I think you can buy Either, maybe they already have a store in the States, not sure. Maybe you'll have to order from Europe. So those vanilles are quite interesting. But the one that I, once I got a decant from a friend in Russia and man, Valkyrie, it's, it's adorable. This is one exception to the rule. I don't like edible sweet vanillas, not my thing, but I absolutely adore. Valkyrie by Sylvain de la Courte. I like the bottles and I like everything about that particular fragrance. I wish I had it in my collection. It's actually in like a hot like short list of perfumes that I want to buy if I ever go back to Europe. Oh my god, this is so good. And I'm looking at its pyramid that's usually created for marketing purposes but and I can't find what's the, the the magical ingredient it must be the combination of vanilla with bitter orange lime basil and mint it's just something else and if you start thinking it's like wait citruses and vanilla what about chalamar girl no 
has nothing to do with lemon tarts, at least not for me. This is way sweeter, like the kind of cheesecake slash lemon tart type of fragrances. They usually balance uh, lemon uh, lemony and van vanillin, edible vanilla type of scents in a different way. This is quite a different story. Okay, I, I have to stop myself. Okay, now the, mom the moment of truth. Who's cooler out of these vanillas? Valentina Mura Saluto. You can vote if you want. Or Sylvain de la Courte Valkyrie. You know, there is something actually similar between them. But for now, I'm still gonna stick with the Sylvain de la Courte Valkyrie. It's just in some ways enchanting. And again, this is a person speaking who doesn't like super sweet edible vanillas, but there's something in Valkyrie that just takes it to another level. It's still not edible, it's appetizing. Love it. Okay, you gotta move on. Yet another approach to bring vanilla to some kind of darkness is to surround it with all kinds of ambery, dried fruits, tonka beans type of story. And the two options that I have here that are very tonka bean heavy, and they pretty much have it in the big, uh, at the at the title is Black Tonka by Esteban and this is a niche brand that is not really talked about a lot so I got a decant from a friend who a connoisseur when it comes to rare niche fragrances she highly recommended this one Black Tonka by Esteban almost strikes me as a little bit powdery like, again, but that's, you know, in comparison to what we're talking about. But otherwise, it's a very comfortable... I don't feel edible vanillin here. It's mostly the kind of comfortable vanilla type of sweetness that makes me think of vanilla paired with tonka bean. Vanilla is not even listed in the pyramid, by the way. What the Fragrantica says is there in the black tonka by Esteban is ginger, pink pepper. I would give it that, not much of a ginger, but it's kind of like pink pepper. I love, love pink pepper as an opening note. Oh my God. This is at least one reason why I fell in love with Sila Lita by Lolita Lumpica, which is, by the way, a younger, lighter sister of black tonka by Esteban. Oh my god, I need to pair them together. There's definitely something there. Very comfortable, somewhat drier, somewhat woodier type of fragrance, but it still makes me think of Vanilla Noir. I, I don't know why, but that's, that's what it is. And another Tonka Bean-centric fragrance that drives Vanilla home to the darker side for me is a very budget-friendly fragrance that um, I was given by my subscriber, otherwise I would have easily overlooked it. This is Banana Republic, Tobacco and Tonka Bean. And again, I haven't, ex haven't expected to like it nearly as much as I really do. This is kind of cool. It's simple, comfortable, the same way as a lot of Elizabeth or Dan fragrances are. You either, you either will find it underwhelming or you will actually love it for daytime wear. And so is Banana Republic Tabanka Tonka Bean. I would say... How does it compare with Dupont Vanilla Leather? Nah. I would say it actually brings it closer to Kayali Vanilla 28. And they all live in the very similar density, kind of almost souffle-like, appetizing but not too heavy. Again, it's a very daytime vanilla noir type of fragrance. I highly recommend when it comes to comparing who does the tonka bean best. To be honest, I'm not ready to answer that question. I have a lot of samples that are very tonka bean centric and I love that as a base note. However, 
I, yeah, I don't have a nuanced enough understanding to tell you which one I prefer more, but I like them both. All right. Yet another, since I mentioned Elizabeth Arden, why not to mention at least one perfume by her that I find to be really balanced and kind of deeper take on floral vanilla, also with a Tonka bean-centric narrative. So this is Elizabeth Arden Always Red. At some point, everybody was buying it left and right. This is essentially a departure away from vanilla centric perfumes toward more fruitier versions when you get kind of like this almost not detectable at first but later detectable swap of vanilla by sweeter praline sometimes caramel sometimes praline sometimes marshmallow notes they are often supported by vanilla in other fragrances and sometimes it's almost hard for me to oh oh this is marshmallow like a praline note it's not vanilla anymore and yet i wanted to bring up <laughs> elizabeth arden always read in this video because as people were buying it like crazy initially people were then decluttering it <laughs> just this, with the same kind of it had very like a lot of churn in um perfume lovers shelves nevertheless i want to say a few words in support of always red and the sweeter fruitier creations by elizabeth arden just in general we can find a lot of stuff very similar to what Elizabeth Arden does in terms of Fifth Avenue Royale, Always Red, somewhat like new renditions that are a little like twists on old favorites. They do just as well in my, in my book as some of the very popular creations by Xerjov, you know, like um, some of those like flamboyant rich releases that sometimes they are more like toward Arabic style of blending sometimes they are more toward or even like the portraits by Pinhaligans they are certainly a little more exquisitely made a little, a little, a little more elegant in the way that the, the, the in, in the way that the whole scent is assembled and yet and we're gonna talk about one of those Pinhaligans today this is, <laughs> it's a horrible compliment, but I'm gonna say it. This is not bad. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. If you're looking for a sweeter, darker scent that is not chemically, like, not so flat, it's almost like, like a, some kind of odorant you can find in detergent or whatever. This is still a perfume composition. This is much better than Bath & Works. And I would say, arguably, it's again comparable with much more expensive options. Here again, I'm gonna talk about Kayali, which I complimented for my starting my new obsession with Vanilla Noir. And yet I'm gonna criticize it just the same way. This is a much different price point, and this is brighter, lasts longer, and has as much of this flamboyant, sweet Vanilla Noir type of nature. The way that the Always Red works it is mostly the, the fruitier, sweeter, praline type of notes. And we could easily dedicate a whole video to fragrances like that. I'm just gonna mention it as an option. And yet another take on darker Vanilla Noir, as I mentioned, fruitier notes, cherry. One cherry that I'm gonna talk about today is Dark Cherry Amber by Banana Republic another generous gift from a subscriber and to me i would have gladly mentioned it in some like dark cherry um video which might be coming if you tell me to do it i'll do it but it's clearly not a by no means this is a clone of tom ford loves cherry let's just keep things leveled here but again, this is why I think this is a very respectful, darker, fruity vanilla scent, nevertheless. Look, and we already are talking about two Banana Republic scents that are so delightfully darker and more interesting takes of vanilla that I would gladly wear them day and night. Which one would I like better though? The Dark Cherry Amber? Banana Republic or Tobacco Tonka Bean. 
I must say, tobacco tonka bean. But again, Cayale Vanilla 28, Sun Dupont Vanilla Leather, Banana Republic Tobacco Tonka Bean, and Dark Cherry Amber all have this very well suited for any occasion if you like Vanilla Noir type of story. Now we're arriving at a very interesting twist, the one that I started seeing more and more. And I wonder if this story outlived itself or we will continue to see new releases. Is combining vanilla with heavier, sweeter musks and jasmine. When it gets vanilla enough is the portrait line by Pinhaligans. And here we, has be we have bewitching jasmine. All right, now we're talking. Soft, finely milled kitchen spices. Think things that you find in desserts when you're baking like a, a pie, a cake. Just so refined, alluring. It's like one of those velvet armchairs where you can just like, you kind of dive into it and then you'll need three people to get you out of that armchair. Oh, this is, this is what takes the comfortable, well-balanced vanilla fragrance from a kind of like, oh, it's great, like the ones that I mentioned before, like Banana Republic, Saint Dupont, Kayali, Rubinia to that degree by Bulgari. This takes comfortable vanilla with an accent of warm kitchen spices and a little bit of jasmine, just like just a tinge, just a tickle, to the level of luxury. It's luscious. Bewitching jasmine is the kind of sweet jasmine scent that I just can't resist. What I can't resist is the price. And you know what else? I found another option and bought a full-size bottle. This is a real revelation for me that I can and do like Mugler scents. For the longest time, everything I tried by Mugler was just like, nope, nope, nope. And yet, oddly enough, some specific flankers, those like oddballs that come out in Mugler line, I just like, oh, this is so great. <laughs> this is exactly the case. This is something that some people know, some people ne never even heard of this line. Mugler at some point released a line that was dedicated to mirrors and they had mirror something, mirror something, mirror something. The one that I fell in love with is the very sensual, sweet, musky, to me vanilla scent, but not edible, but rather darker, almost ambery, I would say, vanilla scent with sweet jasmine on top. And this is Mirror Majestes. I'm not gonna lie, if I didn't have Mirror Majestes by Mugler, I think like I, I I think I would have got Bewitching Yasmin. They're not dupes of each other. I would say Bewitching Yasmin is a little less animalic and a little bit more cute. Like this like finely milled kitchen, like dessert kitchen spices. That's the kind of impression they create for me. It's cute, but it's luscious at the same time. Yet, Mira Majestes is not as screaming as most of the releases by Mugler. I think that's my problem with them. Like, they're a bit much for me. But the, oddly enough, in Mira Majestes, they tone it down just enough that it also became lusciously erotic. So I would say Bewitching Yasmin is one of those <laughs> like lunch dates and Mira Majestes is one of those happy hour dates that just stretch and stretch and stretch and before you know it it's midnight and you're in a place you don't recognize. <laughs> don't ask me how I know. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, and the last one we're going to talk about is 
a bottle that I lasted after for a long time. I wore, I think, one or two decants of it before I fully committed because it was very hard to find with a decent discount. This is Oil Fiction by Juliet Hezegan. Uh, Juliet Hezegan has his main line and this is their boutique line. Luxurious packaging. This is the first thing I fell in love with about this line. I adore the packaging. It's Killian level packaging. Like, not some Tom Ford. Sorry, not sorry, Tom Ford doesn't know how to package perfumes. Killian does. This is Killian level packaging. The only problem that I had with this line, and I think I bought like four fragrances throughout the years, is that they're all tuberose centric and I have oversensitivity to tuberose as an accord. I don't know what exactly to, but most of fragrances that contain prominent tuberose, I just, I get a migraine almost instantly. Oil fiction, either I'm developing tolerance and I've been trying to, or maybe oil fiction doesn't have tuberose as as prominent or maybe it's composed of different ingredients I don't know but oil fiction is the first tuberose that I can wear and I'm not like and I don't have a pounding headache an hour after oil fiction is doesn't intend to be vanilla centric fragrance but similar to mirror majestes this is the kind of vanilla noir twist that I can't explain both of these a very sensual and subtly animalic. They're not as screaming and flamboyantly musky as Rodri Rod um, Narcissa Rodriguez and some other sweet musks, and yet there's something there. It's these, these two, these two, they're kind of hypnotic. When I wear them, it's very hard to get out of that zone of wearing these two. I just wanted to give it a shout out because I honestly don't know where where to where to put it as in terms of the olfactory design. I find that all the fiction kind of either grows on you or doesn't leave a strong impression at all. So oil fiction really grew on me. And I kind of the more I wore it, the more I wanted the bottle. So I have it now. We'll see if uh, if this affair sustains itself longer. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video. If I had to choose only three, I'm gonna try to choose among those that I don't have because that's the whole point of getting decants. I mean, without a doubt, Sylvain de la Corte Valkyrie, it's vanilla. Just, you have to try it. Oh my god, it's wow. It's so unique and it's so good. Bewitching Yasmin, still want it don't want it gosh and now it is between Bulgari Robinia and Valentina Murasud okay I'll have four I'll give myself four imaginary bottles okay it's gonna be Sylvain de la Courte Valkyrie it's gonna be Witching Yasmin Penhaligans it's gonna be Valentina Murasuluto and it's gonna be Bulgari Robinia that's my pick what's yours Tell me what vanilla noir type of fragrances that might not even be not about vanilla per se, but something that you just feel takes you to those sweet dungeons. Tell me about your picks. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.